welcome everyone. I think uh, we've waited long enough. Even though we're running on Asian time today, I do want to keep us uh, on a slight schedule so you can get up to lunch uh, and you know not pass out in here from hunger and tiredness. But uh, welcome everyone. My name is Greg Shu. I am a campus minister at the University of Virginia, uh, working with a group called InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. I specifically work with Asian and Asian American students there. And uh, so today's topic uh, that I'm talking about, to make sure you're in the right place, it's called A Future Together, uh, bridging this great divide between religious and non-religious Asian America, uh, some of the reasons behind that, why that matters, uh, what it does for us, and what we need to do to fix that. Um, but so first, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pair up with someone preferably that you don't know, and give three statements about yourself that summarize your background. Three sentences, three statements, okay? Pair up with someone you don't know, be somebody new, Okay, so uh, I, I just feel like it's, it's a good way to get to know people, just sort of asking, what, is, what are some things about your background? And so let me just share a little bit of sort of about myself. Um, for me, like three statements about me, I would say from my background. Um, so I'm an American-born Chinese, and my parents are both from Hong Kong. So that's, that's me. I'm Kanto, even though I'm actually like half Chinese by blood, but again, no life story. So. Um, two, uh, I grew up going to elite schools that were mostly white, and so therefore I would say a lot of my educational experience is framed in a white context. I went to a private boarding school in Andrew, Massachusetts. I went to Duke University, so there's a lot of whiteness. And where I work now at UVA, there's a lot of white students. Uh, but thirdly, I'd say at the same time, in spite of like having this Chinese background and this white experience, I also grew up in a Chinese immigrant church. So some of my cultural experience has a strong input from this religious side. Um, and so this topic today, the, 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 the definition, the idea of religious and non-religious Asian America and how they seem to be divided, it's of great interest to me because I felt that tension all the time as I was growing up and in school. And I, I think I've cited at different points and different places on the side of that divide, but there's a tension there. Um, so of course it's very intuitively interesting to me because it's something that I've had in my own experience. Um, but not only is it sort of interesting in terms of like sociological effects, I think it's actually very important for us if we're coming to a place like this, this conference, to go back to our schools, to want to affect some kind of positive change on the people around us, the state of our uh, people as an ethnic subgroup. Um, so today we're going to explore more of our origins, uh, including the positive and the negative experiences uh, that bring us together. Uh, we'll look at some of the ways that we end up diverging along religious lines despite our common origins. And then we're going to describe, um, I'll have some practical steps on you know, what we can do when it comes to maybe healing some of that divide. Uh, and also, of course, in there, why I think, I think actually this is the most important issue when it comes to Asian American political dynamics on a college campus. Okay? So let's get started. Let's first, we're going to examine the origins a little more fully. Uh, okay, a little, a little more fully. Um, Part of the uniformity of our origins as Asian Americans, on the East Coast at least, um, is because we all have very similar reasons for coming. Oftentimes if you look at the, the sociological data, some people are like, well, you really can't lump all Asian Americans together because there's so many different nationalities and different languages and all that. And that's very true. But I would say, from what I've known as a professional and in my own personal experience, on the East Coast, the uniformity is very, very consistent, probably because of this. We have very similar reasons for coming. First. For Asians, for Asians on the East Coast, most of us, most of our families immigrated here as a direct result of the Immigration and Nationality Act in 1965. Uh, there were long-time discrimina discriminatory quotas uh, in place that prevented uh, certain countries or certain people of certain races from coming, from coming to the United States. Uh, it was just racist policy. But because the Civil Rights Movement was in full swing at this time, uh, Congress sort of wanted to show that, hey, we're on board too, we're not the establishment, we're actually listening. Uh, and so they decided to, to pass this law that would uh, revoke these, uh, these quotas. Now the funny thing is that the white lawmakers thought, oh, this isn't going to change anything at all. It's not important, the demographics of our country are just going to stay the same. Some of them even went so far as to tell their white constituents, it's all going to be fine, don't worry, we're just being nice. Isn't it nice for us to be nice, right? Uh, they couldn't have been more far from the truth. Because as a result of this, uh, of, this, of this change in the law, immigration skyrocketed and people who had uh, never had access to this country before suddenly were coming in droves. Um, before, before this law passed, uh, immigration counted only for 10% of American population, only 10%, one tenth. By the 1990s, immigration was counting for 33% of American population. So this is an immense surge. Um, so, so many of us, we're here because this law was passed and we were able uh, to get access in ways that we weren't before. And uh, so that's 
Lyndon B. Johnson symbolically signing the act in front of the Statue of Liberty in 1965, just again as a show, it was, it was a political gesture which ended up having really deep consequences, positive ones in many ways, for people like us. Uh, but secondly, um, it's not just that they would let anybody in, though, just because they opened up the quotas. Um, many of the reasons that Asians and Asian Americans were able to come here is because they came for educational and professional reasons. Um, a lot of people I know, they would say, I asked them, well, how did your parents meet? Well, we met in they met in grad school when they were here. Or they met because they were getting like a, a PhD or whatever. You know, A lot of Chinese and Koreans and Indians particularly. For those three ethnic subgroups, this is exceedingly common for their experience. Um, and because at this point, professional workers were ex in extremely high demand, uh, obviously, you know, in, in the Cold War dynamic, trying to sort of drain resources from the other world, obviously this is somewhat strategic, and they couldn't really complain. They said, well, we're getting all these doctors and lawyers and other people, so, you know, it changes demographics in our suburbs, but, you know, it's not so bad. Um, so many people just felt uh, were able to gain, take advantage of this because of their educational uh, aspirations or their experience. Now, of course, this doesn't take into account the significant portion of Asian American life uh, that's blue-collar workers, like restaurant workers, or small business owners, of course. Um, but a lot of those can be accounted for for the third reason. Because many Asian Americans came as refugees of war, specifically refugees of war that the United States initiated. Um, uh, in, uh, especially for, for, for Southeast Asian uh, nationalities, uh, Vietnamese, Laotian, Cambodian, Hmong people, uh, for in, in the wake of U.S. pullout in that region and concession to forces in that area and losing those wars, uh, a lot of people were left in a really difficult situation. Uh, for instance, Hmong people having fought for the United States uh, really were put in a really difficult situation. They were being slaughtered, so they're finally some of them were granted asylum from the United States. Um, and so the thing is, though, when you leave as a refugee of war, it's not like you're necessarily geared up naturally and easily just to go to grad school. Uh, you're leaving because of the political nature, the volatility of the state, of the, of the <coughs> prior country. Um, and so the U.S. is sort of granting this as compensation uh, or sort of reprieve for the consequences of their actions. Um, as a result, though, that has meant that a lot of Southeast Asian, uh, Asian Americans have had a, a really difficult time in this country because of the nature of their arrival. Um, you see, we notice that financial and educational uh, Ascension in Southeast Asian communities has been more difficult and slower uh, on the whole. Uh, we know that gang activity in Southeast Asian communities and, and, that, and populations uh, is higher than in uh, East Asian or uh, nationalities that came earlier, uh, and not as a result of war. Um, and that's through largely no fault of their own, is that they came here, like Vietnamese boat people got off a boat with literally one bag and a shirt because they were fleeing um, you know, the, the communist encouragement. So if you count these three things together, the 1965 uh, Nationality and Immigration Act, uh, educational and professional aspirations, and, and that being the way that people gained access, and asylum as refugees of war, this accounts for the majority of Asian American life on the East Coast. But not only do we have similar, similar reasons for coming, we've ended up actually having pretty similar experiences in America, I'd say. Um, first, most of the second generation has grown up pretty middle class. Regardless of the parents' educational uh, experience, um, Asians tend to be what? Very hard working and fiscally con financially conservative. And as a result of that, uh, through intense saving and a lot of hard work, you know, most of us, it's pretty, I, I would say it's definitely true that we grew up with things our parents did not grow up with. They have risen in the middle class and continue to rise pretty rapidly. Uh, I always have to joke, you know, we're in this like big recession right now, all this debt. I say, well, you can't blame Asian Americans for that because we hate debt. We don't borrow simply, we hate debt because we're all about saving, being financially responsible. Which is why for us, on the East Coast, most of us have some, some sort of a middle class experience, even though our parents may not have had that, regardless of their uh, prior experience. Um, not only that, um, we, uh, this is actually largely because whether the parents are educated or not, higher education has been sort of the desired pathway for the second generation. Um, it's always sort of, we want you to go to college and beyond, even if our parents uh, never had college education themselves. I think it's notable, uh, I mean, yes, it includes immigrants too, but 49% of Asians in this country have a bachelor's degree, compared to 27% of whites. I mean, that includes immigrants, but a lot of that is Asian Americans. A lot of us are in college because that's sort of the, the pathway that we've been led to uh, by our parents. Um, actually, 
and the, the University of Virginia is an excellent example of this, just the emphasis on education. Uh, the state of Virginia has like 5.5% Asians in its population, but UVA has 12.2% Asians and Asian Americans in the student body. Uh, and actually it's probably more than that because they count multiracial Asians like in a separate category. So I think it's probably more like 14 to 15, maybe even 16. I've heard higher numbers out there as well. So it's like an absurdly high number. Uh, this is a public university, state-run university. There's like two, more than two times uh, represent, representation. So obviously education is significant. Um, I think intuitively on the, the data totally backs that up. But I would say also that Asian America, our experience in, our experience in America has actually not all been you know, peachy. Uh, some of it has been pretty difficult. There are hardships. Uh, I would say we still undergo a significant amount of latent discrimination and stereotyping. And, and even like the positive stereotypes that get thrown around, well you guys are like hard working, you're good at math, like that's better than like other things that could be said about you, right? But even the positive stereotypes are actually negative, ultimately, they do bad things. Um, I was recently reading um, an article by uh, Sarah J. Jackson, she's a race scholar from Northeastern University, in response to some of the news media stuff about Jeremy Lin, etc. And, and she's put out there, you know, model minority stereotype that Asians sort of live under. Uh, that has been used to control Asian people just as much as it's been used to denigrate black folk by comparison. Um, and I think that idea of the model minority, it's kind of evidence. There's like a disequilibrium between that, like that role in society and the, pro the product that we end up having as Asian Americans. I mean, we are still underrepresented, despite our very, very, very high level of education, the saturation of education in Asian America. Uh, we are still very underrepresented at the highest levels of corporate and professional America. Uh, there's some like gross statistics, I can't call it to mind now, but like the likelihood of an Asian American who's a lawyer going from a, like, a regular uh, attorney to a partner in a firm is like some disgustingly low percentage compared to how many of them there are in the Asian they have. So we still face some kind of bamboo ceiling, so to speak, as it's been described before. Um, and I mean, you can see it in the, in the media also, like the plenitude of like Jeremy Lin puns. There's at some point after like number six or seven where it kind of crossed the line to like, I can't really tell why the people are, use, are making such a big deal at all, like his name comes like, where's that coming from? And then like some of the signs you see like this, like the Knicks good fortune, right? Like in poor English and a lot of these things. For some reason that's like still okay in this country, uh, even though, well, if you sort of behave as a model minority, like you'll be accepted. Clearly that's not true. Um, and also if you saw that Saturday night, did anyone see the Saturday Night Live skit they did? Okay, that thing made me so uncomfortable because it was so on point. Um, if any of you know about it, you should go look it up. It's just a bunch of commentators really exhibiting a double standard for when it comes to how to discuss race and ethnicity uh, in their discourse. And it, just, it, it was very poignant and it made me really uncomfortable, I think, in good words. Um, but so late discrimination and stereotyping is still rampant in our country. We still face a lot of it. And uh, another thing I would say that um, we continue to be a marginalized ethnic subgroup. I'm going to explain that graphic in a second. Um, we continue to be a marginalized ethnic subgroup. So if the first part of blatant stereotyping and discrimination is like an imposed action against us, whether intended or not, marginalization is ignorance or abandonment from us and, and not being addressed by the establishment. Um, now clearly we're an ethnic group that still faces a significant number of civil rights issues, but we actually rarely receive proportional amount of consideration in politics, in the media, uh, or especially actually on the college campus. I think I've seen this more than anywhere else. Uh, from my own observations as a campus minister, the percentage of civil rights discourse devoted to Asian American issues is, uh, is never matching the percentage of Asian Americans on campus. It's always lower. I mean, in my experience, I've always seen the amount of sort of race or cultural discourse programming given, right? In terms of, you can count up the hours if you want, right? You compare that to sort of like, well, out of their whole spectrum of work, what's the percentage of that program is devoted to Asians? It never matches the population of Asians in the school. That's definitely true at UVA. I can just count. I've done it before. I've looked it up. It's just a matchup. Um, so we're, that's marginalization. That's not actually probably like a, a mean position, just sort of a marginalization of an Asian American uh, awareness. Um, now, being marginalized and ignored often produces policy outcomes that negatively affect us. Um, let me give you a local, a sort of a local example uh, from a friend of mine, um, Wyoming College, and now she's at the University of Michigan Medical School. Um, and I'm going to try not to give the details right, but she's in charge, like she's a leader in one of like their uh, 
like a health service group for Asian Americans. And so what they do often is they organize health clinics for people in the community to come and receive like testing or information or resources and stuff. And um, anyway, so they were organizing this health clinic one time. And they got an email from the administration saying, from now on, just so you know, no student-run health clinics are allowed to perform a specific, like a certain kind of cholesterol test. Um, because it's very wasteful of resources and we always buy and supply them. You can't keep like the testing supplies for too long and you guys never do it right, so you can't keep it. Um, and so they were sort of confused by this because um, some of the reasoning given behind why they were not going to approve this test anymore was they saying, well, actually, the, uh, like the, the, like the minority uh, health clinics are not very well run, they're poorly attended, and you know, students are really bad at doing this test. Now, the last part might be true. She was like, that's actually kind of true. Like, we're not always good at doing this test. But the part about being poorly run, she's like, that's absolutely false. And I was like, well, what do you mean by that? She's like, well, uh, by the data on their campus anyway, like, um, like the Black Medical Association, their clinic was, is not particularly well attended. And there's probably a lot of reasons sociologically why that's the case. But she said, but actually by comparison, the Asian one is overwhelmingly attended. They, they always have like a line that's just out the door because they offer translation services, reading materials in different languages that these Asians cannot get anywhere else. So she's like, yes, like we're not very good at the test, but actually we're going to get it to a lot of people if you let us. But she was just reflecting, you know, they came up with this policy after thinking about it, obviously. They're not stupid people. But they were, the, the only data they were using did not take into account the specificities and the particularities of Asian American state of being around the campus. I'll give you another one on a national level, um, and that's why I have this one up here, the uh, Homeland Security Seal, Citizen, Citizen and Immigration Services. My mother is an uh, immigration lawyer, and so she works, from people, works, works with people from all backgrounds to secure legal um, rights in this country, a variety of ways, and uh, one of the things she often will do is she'll try and help um, like pastoral candidates, or people who want to be a pastor in this country for a church here, she tries to, she tries to get, get them like educational pieces and stuff. But because of, uh, since 9-11, she's told me, it's actually been a thousand times as hard as it used to be. Um, as a result of 9-11, of um, anti-Mexican and anti-Middle Eastern sentiment, there have been across the board restrictions on immigration policy. Uh, but the people she's trying to get in, they come from Taiwan, which is an ally of the United States. So for some reason, they don't at fall under at all sort of like the purview of those policies. These are people coming from an ally nation. And yet she still has offered it because it takes, it takes five times as long, it costs a lot more, it's a lot slower, and I actually never know if it's going to work. Even though these people have clean records and are coming for education to do religious work. Normally it used to be pretty easy, but the climate has changed. That's, I think, to a degree a result of marginalization of Asian Americans. That policy really has nothing to do with the people she's working with, but it ends up affecting them negatively. So these are some of the ways in which our experience in America is really similar. I would say, though, finally, like just in simple terms, um, we all kind of want the same things. Like we all desire similar things. I don't have a slide for it, but we all have similar desires uh, for our, for us in this country. We would all love to see the socioeconomic state of our people improve. We would all love to see uh, discrimination eradicated against our people. I think we would all want that, regardless of your ethnic or national or religious background. That's something that I think I hear consistently in people's experiences. Um, uh, you know what I mean. So, we want all these same things, these similar things together, and uh, if you look at this, this whole thing we've just done, the origins piece, why? Why do I do that? It's because if you look at our origin story, you would actually be led to think that, well, actually, those Asians probably have a pretty good chance of banding together to get stuff done. Unfortunately, that's not been the case. If you have, if you, I mean, you're college students, you've been on the college campus, like, it doesn't actually work out that way. Um, there's a lot of reasons behind it, but the one I want to get at is the religious and non-religious issue behind it. Um, we have this consistent story, but that's not actually the case. We don't end up having a consistent present and future together. Um, so there is an immense amount of Asian American activity and Asian American life on college campus. It's probably one of the richest times in American history for being an Asian or being an Asian American. And the, just a plethora of groups, different kinds of groups of, of an Asian nature on campus just thriving and increasing all the time. Right? But even though there's so much activity in college campuses, um, it's actually fairly obvious that there is disunity in the movement. But disunity obviously thwarts our ability to work together to achieve whatever personal or social or political goals we have. Right? Now most of the time when we think of this disunity, we immediately run to the idea of, oh yeah, well there's disunity between individual organizations, Asian organizations, usually cultural organizations. You think about 
yeah, well, you know, there are different groups of different nationalities, right? And they don't like always, they're not like always really close and get along really well. Sometimes you notice we get a little bit territorial when it comes to membership or, you know, recruiting, right? But sometimes it's like that. And while that definitely exists, there's also plenty of evidence that like it's not terrible. Uh, UV is a good example. There are five or six really big Asian and Asian cultural orgs, most of them are Asian American. And uh, again, the, the quality of the relationship, it really fluctuates depending on the time of year or like who's in, who's in charge of what, right? But, um, but one thing that is true, even when the, like, the relationship like, politically is not great, individual students are always members of multiple orgs. Um, I spend a lot of time with people in the Vietnamese Student Association. I'm not Vietnamese, but I spend a lot of time with them. And inevitably, like, they always play on each other's high-end sports teams, right? They always go to each other's events. They perform each other's culture shows. And, like, not all of that is just, like, for fun. Like, you actually have to, like, work to do some of that stuff, right? So, so while, like, there is this unity, like, you, you see on a wide scale, like, a lot of people work on a personal level to sort of overcome that. So this disunity exists, but to me, in my point of view, it's not that crippling. Um, it's there, but it's not crippling. The one, however, that I think is crippling is the disunity between... Um, religious and non-religious Asians. Because there is almost no evidence of this being overcome whatsoever. Religious and non-religious um, ends up sort of being a side you have to choose and you stay on. That's my experience. That's what I've seen. Um, personally and professionally. So let me just give you an example. Um, I love my alma mater and I love what I did here, but like not everything was I so proud of. Uh, and you just want to look at this divide. Um, at Duke University, the two largest... Asian organizations by membership, okay, in order of size. Uh, number one, Duke University Christian Fellowship, which is not actually an Asian-specific religious organization, which makes both ASA and them feel very uncomfortable, but anyway. Number two, and then number two, Asian Students Association. These are the two most prominent Asian groups on campus. One is religious, one is non-religious. And so they are, they are both sort of like, numerically speaking, vying for narrative control in the university setting, whether they know it or not. Um, but while these two things are so large, these two groups together, there's almost no overlap or membership of membership uh, or leadership between the two. I remember my junior year, uh, the ASA president actually tried to like make entree to kind of like change the situation. So he spent the whole year trying to get to know people in InterVarsity uh, and reaching out to, to, to our leaders. He wanted to collaborate with us. He attended things. He was contributing to our fellowship events. Like I was, so I was the leader of like, I guess you call it musical worship, and so there's like a band, and like you do some teaching. So I like, even though he's older than me, I let him, because he was just trying to get in and build a relationship with us. He worked all year to bridge that gap. And at the end of it, unfortunately, there was almost no change to speak of. The membership uh, overlap did not increase, and support for each other's events did not really increase either. And, and this was really, really evident um, in the Lunar New Year uh, show that they put on you know, in the spring. You saw some of those acts last night. So those people are really talented people. These students doing great stuff, great art, like it's awesome, it's a lot of fun. It's not like it's politically contentious either or anything, right? It's not that they're going to disagree about, like, oh, like, Lunar New Year, we all celebrate that. You would imagine there's much unity, and there's not. Because out of 170 Asian students, myself included, uh, in Duke University, less than 10 participated in performing the show. Less than 10. Even the year that the Duke State president worked his tail off trying to get to know people, right? This is their premier event, largest cultural show on campus, and we, we couldn't send more than 10 people who want to perform. This is this big divide. You can have a trucker to work through this thing. Um, um, and, and it's not just that there's a disunity. Sometimes this devolves into straight up possibility. Um, I, uh, in my work as a campus minister at UVA, I've, that, I've like, tried really hard. Now, the Asian University I work with is like kind of strange. If you want to know more about it, like I try really hard to, to be a like, real bridge builder fellowship, that, which is kind of rare, right? It's not a normal thing. But anyway, to do that, I've tried to get to know leaders of all these different organizations, regardless of their personal or religious affiliation. Just try to get to know them. And inevitably, as I've gotten to know them, every time and every organization, I hear from some of their leaders a note of suspicion or distrust about one of the large Asian fellowships, like religious groups on campus. Every Asian org. They don't always get along with each other, but they're all like, what do you feel about them? <laughs> in a really loaded way, they always ask me that question. And I have to be careful how I answer that, because what they're really asking me is, like, are you like them? Because if you are, then I don't know if we want to continue this conversation. That's the, that's the dynamic of it. It's outright hostility in many cases. And that distrust goes both ways. Um, and I would say that in, inevitably sometimes that becomes, instead of like trying to work out differences, they actually end up um, sort of 
straight up insulting the other or like recruiting against the other. So such disunity is hostility. Um, but, but maybe you're led at this point to say, like, okay, yeah, yes, Greg, maybe this disunity is deep and it's hostile. But I think it's, it's not just an issue of quantity of like how much disunity there is. My claim is that this disunity between among religious versus non-religious Asians is qualitatively different than the first one we described. The first one we described is the disunity between individual Asian orgs. That's wrapped up in cultural nuances, relational interactions, and, and more or less, even though they don't always quite get along, the groups are more or less congruent about their interests and what they're doing. So it's just an issue more of how they relate to each other along that similarity. However, religious and non-religious divide, it's actually about two entirely different worldviews that must actually come together, though, if we hope to achieve the outcomes that we desire as people. I believe that each one holds one of the necessary keys, and, and more than that, each group actually, not to, you don't just need to like learn to get along. I believe each group actually needs the other to achieve the very things that they are dreaming of. Okay. Why is that? Well, I think it's two halves of a whole. The reason I believe this is, is because pure will and numbers and, and just events, that, that, that's good. It doesn't change the dynamic in itself. Um, we need something more than that. I mean, I mean you, were, you were at the, the session last night. You think about what were the keynote speakers saying last night and today? Dream, right? Dream. Have dreams. Have big dreams. But, but dreams, what are they? They're made of more than just fantasy and, and, and interest. I mean, what is a dream? A dream is a, a spiritual or a moral hope that is made into the physical reality by work and action. And, and that's why we can see that actually, oh, religious and non-religious sides are so important. Because each one of those sides has one of those ingredients. One of them has the spiritual and moral component. And the other side has the physical and cultural component. And they're both equally necessary. Um, well, religious Asians, let's, let's get into that. Um, why do they do what they do? Are they as crazy as you think they are, right? What are they like? Well, religious Asians, let's, let's try to understand them on their own terms. Because the way that they organize their lives is they are orienting themselves around a supernatural and a spiritual reality. To them, in their experience, they understand that like the world is a physical world, yes. But not everything that matters in the world is quantifiable or physical. Um, they would probably say that you know some of the most important things about life, like you know the stuff that makes up love, the power of conviction, uh, or moral strength, right? These things are actually, in their essence, mysterious and transcendent and sacred. You can't bottom them up. You can't count them. They are something deeper and, and uh, numinous. As a result, they see the world through a lens, and, and through this lens, and they try to seek to know the truths about you know, what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. And, um, and because they hold these things most dear, they are willing to organize literally every minute of their life around it. <laughs> if you notice, right, Asian religious groups are like mad hardcore about how many events they have in a given week, right? Because there's so many things that they do, like there's prayer groups and a Bible study or meditation or like this activity or this that activity. Um, there's so many exercises. Why are they pervasive? Because they want to they immerse themselves in the spiritual in order to cultivate their moral and spiritual growth, because they, they think this is the most important thing. So that's actually why, like, Asian religious groups, unless the group is, like, really poorly run, okay? Uh, the Asian religious groups, um, the members of those groups are, like, absurdly, ridiculously committed. Like, ridiculously committed. They come out to at least, like, three things a week. Um, I cannot think of any other kind of organization except for, like, a frat or story during a rush, okay? That can get you to come out for, like, an hour and a half three times a week. And we are Asian people. We study all the time. Are you kidding me? Like, what? <laughs> Most of these are, like, studying kinds of kids. Why do they do that? Because they're dead set about how important it is. I mean, just in my own experience, like, now, I was, I was like, not super typical because I was a leader and everything, but I just think about it, right? Uh, we had a Bible study, and, like, I led a different Bible study, and, like, I was in the worship team training, and I was, we'd do large group and music, and, like, that's, like, two hours, and then I was mentored by my staff worker, and I would mentor two other students. So that's, like, that's, like, ten hours right there. And I wasn't the only one who did that. And even if you were just a member, never leading anything, that's, like, four and a half hours on a regular basis. So, actually, like, whether you like it or not, religious groups, especially Asian religious groups, are the ones that regularly draw the largest crowds, the most, the most participants, the most often. Okay? Um, but what does that mean for us? I, I think that that actually proves that there is something going on in their dynamic of what they're actually pursuing. Like, 
they have a moral and a spiritual commitment that like transcends like their physical capabilities or everything that looks sort of they, they should be doing. There's sort of like a superhuman kind of almost level of, of commitment that's going on there. Um, lost my place. Uh, and I don't think it's because they're exceptional human beings. Like I think if anyone tells you, oh, like religious agents are just better people, that's crap. That's not true. I would say that most of what it is about their commitment and like their willingness to just put down time and energy and whatever is because whatever they're experiencing in that spiritual immersion time is doing something for them that like transcends their physical limits. I firmly believe that person, on a personal basis, and just if you look at it, um, I mean it's well documented that people who pray on a regular basis are less stressed and live longer. I mean, you could just say, yeah, that's your biochemical. Okay, that's fine again. <laughs> like, I think there's other things that are going on there. And I actually think you can actually sometimes quantify moral, this sort of like moral conviction thing. We talked about the number of hours that people give into it. I can actually probably give you sometimes like a, a numerical estimate. So for me to do the work that I do as a campus minister, I'm a nonprofit worker. To work for Asian University, to work for university, I have to raise about $60,000 a year in donations uh, to be employed, to have all my services done with like, my office and stuff like that. That's got to happen. $60,000 a year. It's not a small amount of money. And it gets bigger every year. So when you get a raise, it actually makes your life harder. But anyway. Um, and so in order to do that, I have to get donations from people. Um, now, a lot of my coworkers who are white staff, white staff workers, doing what I do, white students, um, this economy has made it incredibly difficult for them to find new donors. I mean, this economy, the economic state is like pummeled like everybody across the board in the face. But like strangely, I would say that I have actually had a pretty easy time. Uh, I have had like this uncanny stability in my like donor in increase on a regular basis, and like I, I try to talk about it carefully because like I don't want to make them uncomfortable, make them feel bad. Like, it's just I'm blessed because like eight religious Asians like they straight up give a higher percentage of their income than non-religious Asians, and like it's not like it's easy. There are people I know who are giving to me who are not exactly yeah, having work right now, and I'm just like, why would you do that? Because they believe something. Because something is driving them to do that. It's a moral conviction that transcends the physical reality. Okay. It's a superhuman moral conviction. It's not because they're inherently better people. It's because their spiritual experience endows it into them. I would also say, just sort of as a passing note, like, because of like this spiritual experience they have, like, healthy, that's the operative word, healthy Asian religious communities end up producing healthy people. Um, like, you know, the fellowship that I was in, Duke University, mostly Asian, I was pleasantly surprised when my experience there was, was a, a positive one. Like, I came in sort of, like, skeptical about, am I going to like this stuff? I grew up in the church, I'm, like, kind of skeptical about this stuff. And I actually had a good time, because I found that, like, our experience there was not sort of about imposing, like, our, our identity or, like, emotional crap on each other, but we actually, like, sorted it out because of our spiritual experiences. And that was, like, a refreshing change, because in high school, like, most of my life was, like, the pursuit, like, was, was me trying to, like, project or like deal with my, I don't know, uh, insecurities as a short Asian male uh, into like misanthropic, athletic, or social, or romantic aspirations. So I got this talk and I was like, oh, wow, like, this is actually really different. And like, I actually, like, it's actually doing something for me. Like, we're not just like here to like, you know, sing songs in the dark or whatever. Wow, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that healthy religious communities actually end up helping, like, producing healthier people. Here's an example of this. My friend, uh, her name is Rita, and um, she, she didn't grow up in like a religious home of any kind, but she knew a lot of Duke IV people because of her classes. And uh, she, she said to me one time, you know, I think it's really strange and kind of fascinating. Um, all the IV people I met, like, we, we're like pretty similar in terms of experience. Like, we get good grades and bad grades, but what, like in our classes. But whenever the Duke IV people that I know get bad grades, they are way less stressed and way less upset than I am. Like, intellectually, they're no less upset, but like, actually, like, what it does to them is like way less. And she's like, I think that's kind of strange. And as she sort of got to know them a little better, she's like, oh, I understand. Like, it's because for, for her religious friends, their identity is wrapped up in a spiritual reality that transcends the physical, that can overcome the physical if necessary. She was like, okay, that's really different. That's kind of interesting. It's kind of nice that they're like not stressed. There is, however, um, okay, sorry. And so I think this kind of commitment and conviction um, and wherewithal and focus, um, what that does for us, like, that's like a good thing. Like, 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 can you imagine having the kind of commitment it takes to, to surpass and overcome any kind of physical barrier and kind of a persistent view, you know, just continuity? I mean, how better to bring about a dream into reality um, than, than to just constantly be able to see it even though it's not yet here? 
causing you to see the spiritual, moral, hope thing that's not you here and keep aspiring and living your life around the pursuit. I mean, that's half of what it takes to get a dream. Is a, mere, is, a, is a spiritual and moral conviction that surpasses the physical reality. That's half of the way it's going to take to, to reach this case. But there is a negative side effect. And I, I, have to, I, I can't shy away from this. This is the negative side effect. All of the spiritual immersion for religious agents can end up making them a little detached from the physical reality. I don't mean detached from like materialism. I actually think that's a good thing. Frugality and not being wasteful is a good thing, right? But when I say detached from the physical reality, they, uh, they sort of see the spiritual things as transcendent, so they kind of like feel like, I'm delivered. <laughs> they just feel like, they're floating, you know, and you know, right at the table. <laughs> and, and they sort of say, like, oh, this doesn't matter. Like, I'm delivered by my spiritual experience. Which can get really annoying, like, if you if you tell people like that. Like, I, I mean, I'm aware of that, right? They can be kind of annoying. Um, and, and the worst part is that they end up actually denigrating, insulting the physical reality that is around them that other people care so much about. Because their religious experience delivers them from that mess. What's even worse is that the mess stuff, like, oh yeah, the physical reality is a mess. They end up lumping their ethnic and cultural experience into that mess. Probably because they experienced what blatant discrimination, stereotyping, right, and marginalization. Their way of coping was like, well, like that's a bad thing. And a lot of other physical things are like bad things. And spiritual things can overcome bad things. So like let's just pretend my ethnicity is a bad thing. And like let's just like deliver that. So that's why you you'll often hear like religious Asians, like they'll look at like some of these non-religious or like cultural Asian folks, and they're like they, they sneer. They're like, man, like, I don't get those people. Like, why are they so obsessed with their ethnicity? Like there are more important things in the world. These spiritual things are so much more important. Why do they always obsess about something as trivial or stupid or physical or small as race? Uh, now, that's actually really weirdly hypocritical because most people who say that are actually in predominantly Asian or Asian-specific religious organizations. So their spirituality is actually tempered by their ethnicity. But that's another talk for another time. So, anyway, it's, it's very hypocritical. And I think if you're not a religious Asian, you probably come across that and you're like, heck yeah, that's hypocritical, that's ridiculous. Because this is where the non-religious Asian side comes in. Um, they, they hear something like that, and they're like, whoa, hold up, slow your roll, like, you can't say that. Because if you're a non-religious Asian, when you hear something like that and you say, mm -mm, my entire life, good or bad, is bound up in the fact that I'm Asian. So why the heck should I not orient my entire existence around? Every choice that I've ever made, or my parents have ever done, or anything about sort of about school, like, and all these things are wrapped up in my Asian experience. So why shouldn't I wrap my entire identity and life around it? You think the spiritual is so important? How about the physical? How about the cultural? This is important to me. And that's the non-religious agent's claim. And I think it is just as valid. It's equally true. Because there's an awareness of the physical and cultural reality um, that is very accurate and very complete. You, you notice that it's, uh, it's usually non-religious Asians who are the ones who, you know, they take part in the Asian Pacific Studies classes, or they're the ones who care about Asian Pacific History Month. Um, they're the ones who are fully aware of the progress that has been made, and they're also fully aware of what remains to be done. Whereas religious Asians, because of their like religious enclave, they like insulate themselves from discrimination, and they also tend to like, dip, like statistically speaking, discount the discriminatory experience they have. They're like, well, like that was one time. It's probably actually ten times. Like, just pretend it's one time. So like, see, it's not that bad. Like, that's not that bad. If you're not a religious Asian, you don't have that like buffer zone. You're like, no, I see for what it really is, and sometimes it sucks, right? And so, why shouldn't I worry my identity around my Asian experience? So, this produces a lot of really good results. So, in the face of this kind of injustice and this discrimination, um, non-religious Asians tend to fight back in a creative fashion by trying to be this. They're the strongest advocates to both preserve traditional and original culture, and they're also the ones who tend to be charting new forms of Asian American culture forward. Um, I think it's worth noting that a lot of Asian religious groups they tend towards assimilatory cultural modes. What do I mean by that? If you're like an Asian Christian in particular, if you're Chinese or Korean, if you sing Hillsong, that's written by a bunch of white people, and like their view and experience of God is really not the same, like it is really not the same as, uh, as, as being an Asian person. And so like, while there are ways in which we can transmute that, we are losing things in translation. We just say, oh, well, let's just sing those instead. I mean, I don't, I don't want to write, we don't write our own stuff. We almost never find Asian like religious artists who want to write their own stuff. That's a really strange phenomenon. But in my work as a campus minister, I've always noticed that like, both, like the orgs care about all these things together. Right? They care about these two things, like social cause and socializing, right? But they tend to plan socializing proactively and easily. Oh, I can't wait for the next poker night, party, whatever, right? I can't wait. We're going to do that next time. 
And they end up usually uh, playing the social cause stuff reactively. So like, well, we really need to do something this semester. Or, well, I, uh, I really want us to, you know what I'm going to say. Right? It, it, that's the trend that I've seen in a lot of the Asian orgs. And it's not for lack of trying or interest. But for some reason, there's this vacillation. Um, and, and instead of being proactive about the social causes, it's being reactive. Now, I do not think that non religious Asians are like bad or weak people. Don't walk away here at me when I say this next part, okay? That's not what I think. Um, but I think the reason this vacillation occurs is because when you deal primarily in physical realities, it gets really hard to distinguish which are prioritized and which comes first. Like, they both have, they both have weight and they both have substance. Like, what are you going to do, right? And actually, when it comes to like the social causes stuff, that stuff is always hard. Like it's always harder to get the kind of interest that you want, and it's not as fun or gratifying. Usually, it takes a lot of hard work, and so um, it, 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 it actually, to me, requires a moral empowerment that is difficult to find. It's not easy to get what it takes to, to see that kind of stuff through. I don't think you can conjure that up just from knowing the earth as it is. I don't think that non-religious Asians lack moral or philosophical drive. That's not what I think. Um, but I think that what is lacking is sufficient fuel to get us there, to make these kinds of changes, right? Because here's the thing. If you see the world as it is for all its goods and bads, if you look at it straight as it is with your own two eyes, with clear eyes, like, it's really easy to get discouraged with how much things are sucking. So you're like, I don't know if you want to do social cause stuff. It's like, I just get tired. Like, it's just hard. I just never as much participation. I just cost so much energy. Like, should we do it? Can we do it? We can act, at least we can get them all out to come to like, the party that we're going to do or whatever and everything. You know, and, and if you don't have some kind of outside of yourself wherewithal strength, I don't blame you for not doing it as much. It's really hard. So even though you are aware of like what to do, none of those agents have a hard time still achieving those things. Okay, so what do we do? What's, what's the final part? I'll make sure that's all what we need to do is re rediscover and reconcile. Um, in a broad sense, we need to rediscover the inheritance that we have. Because both of these sides, religious and non-religious, have something to share about that inheritance. And then we need to reconcile with each other because the other side is going to be the one to teach us about the one that we're missing. Okay? Um, I don't think what we need is like new organizations or new initiatives or new programs. Like, no offense, but that's kind of like the white political way to do stuff. Let's come up with a new like slogan. Like, it'll help. Like, like Asians don't work that way. Like, we, we're about like people and like connections and like you have like you got to prove it. You can just say it and have it be true. Like, you got to do something. That, that looks different. We need, um, we actually need a new culture. We need a new culture, and I'm not here to talk about what specifically those dreams look like for us, but if we're gonna achieve any of them, we need a culture where religious and non-religious come together to share the resources they have with one another. Um, and, and when you see this, like, actually work itself out, then these people on both sides are actually able to spontaneously come together to do things and work together and achieve these dreams. Now, I think, I'm, not, I'm a pragmatist, like, I don't just say things like make warm and fuzzy. But I actually think that you can each individually help improve this situation. Why? Because a culture is not built upon physical artifacts. It's built upon person-to-person -person relationship, right? So if you make personal choices about how you want to engage the religious and non-religious divide, you can actually, on your part with the people that you know, create a new cultural interaction, a new dynamic that actually is defeating the pre existing dynamic. And, and this can only be done on a person-to-person -person level. Events will not do this for you. Events do not change relationships into themselves. People change relationships. And that's what's going to take place in culture. I genuinely believe that you can have a, a difference in this area. Um, both sides have some things they need to rediscover, rediscover with their inheritance. Um, so, so let's look at this. What does that look like? Well, first, we have to resist and remove our bias against the other. Let me start with religious agents. I'm going to get on people like us for a minute because like, we, we really suck sometimes. Um, you know, we've definitely abandoned a necessary and legitimate piece of our inheritance. Um, I mean, all of our Asian religious expressions, like, they affirm the physical reality and, like, its goodness. Okay, like, I'm not an expert, but, like, from what I know, most people in their true religious experience, like, the true religious, like, scripture and text or whatever, like, the physical reality is not usually seen as, like, a terrible, evil thing. And definitely, like, the culture is not part of that inherently. This is not part of that. We always just lump it in there as if it is. Um, you're like, like as a Christian specifically, I would say like your cultural heritage is part of your inheritance as like a God-made person. And you can interpret that to whatever religious uh, um, um, viewpoint that you have. As a God-made person, your ethnicity is part of you. It's not coincidental, it's purposeful, I would, I would claim that. 
And, and if you cast it aside instead of like spirit, you cast aside your ethnicity and the physical stuff, and you just want the spiritual things, like you just end up sort of floating in the clouds. You can never bring these dreams to reality, and you are detached and distant from the world as it is. Um, let me say this as a minister to those who are Christians, like, like to use Bible, some Bible speak, like right now, like we have to stop using our identity, uh, spiritual identity, as a reason to detach from the physical world and ignore it. That is not God's way. That is not the example of Jesus. Um, that's actually abusing our relationship, like in God's family, to sort of lord ourselves over other people. Um, and that's wrong. We actually need to grow up and get serious about being loving and gracious to all people, not just people in our fellowship or with our religious beliefs, but especially the people who have different or non-religious backgrounds, because we've done such a bad job prior to this. Um, they are actually right about the physical reality. I firmly believe that they're actually right about the physical reality. Um, you need them to teach things um, to you. I need them to teach things to me. Um, as a Christian, specifically, God affirms the value of the physical reality. He's not trying to like burn it. He wants to fix it and heal it. Just go read Revelation. We can talk about it later if you happen to be of that persuasion and you want to know about it. Okay? Do not abandon your ethic inheritance. That's a, that's a joke. Uh, and that's, that's dangerous. For the non-religious Asians, I need to first apologize for the fact that like you have probably had some bad experiences with religious Asians. Like, they made you feel inferior or insulted you. Um, and if that's been the case, I'm really sorry. Because like people like me who grew up in Asian churches tend to do that. I'm sorry for that case. And you have lots of reasons to distrust religion and spirituality. I understand that. But even so, I feel like I have to challenge you in this area. And, and I want to hope hopefully I'm nuanced about how I go about this. And I hope that, that I'm clear. Um, I have to challenge you because there is a danger in rejecting spirituality that will actually make you culturally hypocritical without even knowing it as well. Just as if, like, Asians tend to be hypocritical, they're like, oh, like, my spiritual, my, my ethnicity doesn't matter, just my spirituality. Uh, there's the opposite side for, for you folks. Your cultural inheritance, like ethnic inheritance, it actually includes a lot of religious and spiritual stuff in it. Like Asian culture, every Asian ethnicity has always affirmed the coexistence of physical and spiritual realities together. Um, it's actually American secularism and Western atheism that claim that physical and spiritual cannot coexist and they force you to make a choice. But Western atheism is not a path you are obligated to take. Um, you are Asian. You are not post-enlightenment, individualistic, intellectual, skeptical. That's not what you are. You are Asian. That is not you. You may have learned about how to be that way in school, but that's not the way that you are at home. That's not the way that you are when it comes to who you really are. That's not your Asian identity you live by. Western atheism is not inherently part of who you need to be. I mean, take, for instance, your parents, okay? Even if they're not, like, a specific religion, <laughs> They are incredibly like superstitious people. Okay, I'll put that with quotes, right? But they're like, make sure you don't wash your hair during this time of the month, right? Or this time of the month. It's gonna kind of like mess with you, like you're gonna get sick, and like it's like a deep kind of sickness, and like, you don't wanna do that, like you're like this, right? And then they also do things like during certain festivals, or like, you know, uh, for the Vietnamese, like Thetcha, you gotta like do certain things so that you make sure you get like good luck for the next year, otherwise you guys are screwed, right? You gotta be like, you care about like feng shui and qi go, and like the, the, the way the room is set up, because if you don't, like the answers are someone's gonna get pissed at you, and like, you, you don't necessarily always like understand what they're talking about, but what your parents are really saying is like, yeah, the physical and the spiritual kind of coexist, and I'm not stupid enough to mess with that. Like, I respect it, okay? So it's actually Western atheism that looks at that and is like, oh, you guys are so superstitious. They denigrate that straight up. And they say, like, anyone who believes things like that are, like, you're just unwashed heathens. But actually, like, a lot of our parents who are college-educated and beyond believe these kinds of things. Now, I am not myself advocating that, like, you believe in, like, a kitchen god or, like, you know, <laughs> like I don't believe, like, karmic luck or anything like that, right, okay? But actually, that view of the world is more correct and it's more authentic to who you and your parents actually are. The spiritual religion is actually more who you are than Western atheism. That's not your inheritance. You don't have to, you don't have to keep it, okay? Um, so we often look at something like, especially like Christianity, right? And you say, well, like, it's a cultural imposition by, like, an occupying power. So, too, is the imposition of, like, the non-religion of Western atheism. That is also an imposition of an occupying power. So, like, I encourage you, like, unless you've, like, thoroughly sat down and thought through really well, thought through really well why Western atheism is, like, what you want to be. Like, you actually probably should not be it because accidentally you are actually doing something very assimilative, okay? I want to that generally, but that's absolutely true. In a cultural sense, you're actually being hypocritical in that way. And I don't want that for you. I don't want that for you, okay? So, um, let me just read the last one. Once we've corrected this bias stuff, right, what do we do with that? Once we realize that we've got bias, we're going to get open. Well, then we need to taste what we're missing from the other side. For religious Asians, like, you need to join an Asian org, and anything you can do that doesn't contradict your spiritual beliefs, like, you should do. 
Like, you should get involved in the family. You should do the culture show. You should just participate. Like, get involved. See what they do and just taste it. And because it's actually kind of fun and you'll learn something. I mean, I was, I did a, you know, the UVA VSA step show last, uh, last week. My first time participating in a cultural show, I was humbled and I learned a lot. Honestly, genuinely, totally was humbled and learned a lot of new things. It was good for me. I was like, that was awesome. Um, so, yeah. I was, uh, I'm hoping that that's what religious leaders can do. Get involved in Asian origin, like, let's say that. For non religious folks, okay, you should try religious things. Um, you do it with people you trust. I'm not saying do it willy nilly, like, you just don't pick anybody off the street, but, like, do it with people you trust. Um, ask them to take you to church, or to read their scripture, or to pray with you, or try praying and, like, ask them to teach you how. Like, just do it. Ask them about what is their spiritual experience like? Why does it matter to them? Why is it so important? Why do they organize all their hours of the day around it? What, what's the value? Um, just try for yourself spiritual and religious activities, um, because you know you might find that you actually get a taste of that power beyond yourself, and like you doesn't want some of that, right? Um, <laughs> so finally, uh, the last thing. Yeah, I'm so over set up the time. Um, the last thing is once you've done these two things, what can you do? Uh, you can learn to understand the other side on their own terms this year. Right? You reject your bias, you taste, what they're, you taste the thing that they're cooking, and you kind of learn how they cook and why they cook that way. For religious Asians, like, you should take Asian studies classes and get informed. Like, we are so disgustingly uninformed about political issues and like, just the nature of current affairs. Like, that's just awful that we don't know stuff. Like, most Asian Christians or non -religious, or religious Asians don't know who like, Danny Chen is. That's a problem. That's a serious problem. Okay? Um, you may not end up agreeing with everything. I certainly never do, but like, I'm always enriched by it. And conversely, for non-religious Asians, like, you should learn, like, okay, so now that you believe all this, like, you look at all the people with their spiritual stuff, like, ask them why they believe that, get to know it. You may not end up adopting it yourself, but I think you will be enriched and blessed by it in some form or fashion, okay? Ask, them, ask your friends to explain these things to you, okay? Because ultimately, when you do that, final point, you will each gain the key that the other side possesses. You're each going to have a power from the spiritual side and a power from the physical side that you currently lack, whichever side you end up on. Uh, and you'll be top of the other side. Because if we can do that, like then we'll actually be able to pursue the goals that we want um, for our people and our families. Um, and then we might actually have a future together, the one that we've been dreaming of. So that's all I've got. Thank you.